Different forms of businesses go in hand with different tax implications. Today, we speak about the key tax consequences of doing business in two major forms, the sole proprietorship, Doiminimi, and the limited liability company, Osakirchte. Our guest today is Risto Valden, a tax and accounting specialist, former researcher at Aalto University. Risto, welcome to our course. Could you please introduce yourself? Well, thank you, and, and thank you that I have a possibility to hear, uh, tell about these uh, important things. And, and uh, I'm tax and accounting specialist, and I'm working here. I've been a, an owner and entrepreneur in, in a bilance company now last 13 years. Before that, I used to work 10 years in Aalto University in Helsinki School of Economics, and, and, and before that in tax government as a tax inspection functions. And so it's, uh, I write a lot, I teach a lot, mainly professionals, tax professionals and accounting professionals. And, and, it's, uh, and I, I, I must say that I'm uh, nowadays absolutely one of the most slick tax specialist in Finland. Why is entrepreneurship important to you? I would say in, in my work, I work mainly with the companies like a small and medium-sized enterprises. And for me, it's very fascinating to see all different kind of professionals and all those skills, how they differ, and to see and realize that in every kind of business lines, there's certain kind of skills and knowledge which is which you don't understand if you are not working deep inside of that business. And that's fascinating to help in my job, those entrepreneurs and companies to continue and somehow somehow in a, uh, manage in a competition. And for me, it's, it's kind of a, in my work and my entrepreneur, it's kind of a, the main, main a joy of my work. So uh, what are the main types of companies or kinds of legal entities that entrepreneurs use as tools and what are the tax implications of those main types? So the, the, uh, I would say that, that according to this company law, company acts, uh, those company types can be divided into two groups. First one is the group of which are kind of a personal companies. They are not separated from the entrepreneur, and those are this solely proprietary toiminimi and avoin yhtiö, kommandit yhtiö. And the meaning of those uh, company types is that they are actually just uh, accounting entities inside of that one person's wholeness. So they are not separate companies, they are not separated from the private person's own kind of a property and income and costs. And then we have this second type, which is kind of a capital companies, which are these limited liability companies as, as in, in most cases, and also this kind of a uh, osuuskunta type of companies. But that's important to realize that there's two different types. And the idea is that, that you choose according to this company act, you choose kind of uh, the most suitable, most light and practically easy company view. But in practice, the taxation disturbs this, this kind of uh, uh, choose of the company form, because the taxation implications are so, uh, so uh, much different between these two types of companies. So there are um, companies which are kind of their own companies, capital companies, um, limit liability companies, Osaka, Uchti and Finnish. And then there are companies like partnerships and sole proprietorships, which are not their own tech subjects. Exactly. Yes. And that's, that's the kind of, uh, the uh, I would say that the problem with this, because uh, uh, beside of this taxation issues, there's also more and more coming kind of uh, those risks and responsibilities 
So in these capital companies, this limited liability, it's a possibility that you separate the risk of the loans and, 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 and losses from your private life. And also it means, means that it's a, in a taxation, you can make it separate. That how much you take out from your capital company, that's the most important, which affects to your private taxation. And if you don't take anything out of that, there's no tax implications in your private life. None. But in this private person companies, you can't kind of divide that life and results and profits and taxable income from your private life because you are the taxpayer anyhow of those incomes. So that means that um, an entrepreneur that acts via uh, a capital company, limited liability company, can, does not pay tax based on the earning of the companies because the income is taxed at the level of the company and he or she then um, only when he or she takes out money or gets money from the company pays tax him or herself whilst in case of a, a partnership or sole proprietorship the income of um, the partnership or sole proprietorship is taxed immediately at the level of the entrepreneur him or herself Exactly. And that, that happens uh, once a year and you can't kind of, uh, you have to accept it. If it's loss or profit, anyhow, the income comes to your private life. And also that other thing is kind of, uh, if, for example, if you take high risks loan from the bank and you might lose, uh, may make losses and you lose the money or you buy something in debt in these private companies, it means that, that losses, you pay them from your own money because you can't divide those risks. And that's more and more, uh, uh, more and more kind of a, more too difficult, for example, to uh, have, a, have a company with uh, other owners, many owners or more complicated uh, risks. And therefore this limited liability companies, Osakeyhtiö is kind of a, now the major and kind of the main form of making business. And also it, it, uh, it, it's, it makes it possible to have this kind of a, a very effective tax planning at the same time. So did I understand correctly that if Risto here would be, you would be a customer? And more it's on this side would be the entrepreneur. Uh, in this uh, toiminimi format, uh, he would do business with you and he would be then taxed based on kind of that business and whatever income, other income he would have. But if he would start a limited liability company, as in myself here, the business would happen between you, the customer, and the company here, and he could then kind of adjust the taxable income based on what happens here between the entrepreneur and the limited liability company. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And, and that, that's a, a good example because then we make a contract kind of uh, I buy something from who I buy it from the company. And then the owner of the company doesn't know anything about it and is not part of our agreement. He's just the owner. And that's exactly what happens. And it separates the owner from the activities. And from a tax perspective, the difference then is that um, um, in case there is no company in between, well, the income which I earn as a person, as an entrepreneur, is taxed directly on my level, in my personal um, taxation. Um, whilst here, if we have a company, uh, then the income earned by the company is taxed at the level of the company. And if I don't take out any income, then I'm not taxed on it because it just remains in the company. But once I take it out, then I'm taxed as well. So we have here two levels of taxation. And in the case of the sole proprietorship and the partnership, we have only one level of taxation. Yes, yes, that's, that's exactly how it goes. So let us focus on the limited liability company. 
what is the income of the company and how is it determined? Yes, uh, from the income taxation point of view, the uh, the accounting principle, this this accrual basis, not cash basis, and it means that what you have earned during the let's say one year or or this uh, uh, this financial statement period, and and what you have uh, cost as a cost. But when you have paid and when you got the money, it's not, not the important, important thing. And, and this goes through accounting. So all the companies, as well as Toiminimia, as well as this uh, Osakeyhtiö, they, are, uh, they have uh, accounting responsibilities. And it means that all what has happened with that entity must be in uh, accounts. And it means that it's either income or cost or some funds or some liabilities. All kind of uh, all, the, all the agreements on, on all the activities must be in accounting. Also in this Toiminimi world. But there is the accounting rules are much lighter and it's easier and not so kind of bureaucratic, this accounting side. But also in small companies, the different nowadays, it's not kind of a big issue. Okay, so does this mean that um, for limited liability companies, I have to do this um, double entry bookkeeping, where I, I have to kind of make a so-called balance sheet where I have the assets and the liabilities, and then I record the costs and the income in a profit and loss statement. And uh, what comes out of the profit and loss statement is the, the income which I have to tax. Does it work this way? Yes, yes. And that's, that's the uh, first step. And uh, according to the accounting law, all the activities must be in accounting, even if they are tax-free or costs, even if they are not deductible. They must be in an accounting. Because this accounting is a base for this taxable income calculation. And then comes into the picture some differences between tax law and accounting. So all the costs which you have to put into your accounting maybe are not fully deductible in taxes. And all the income which you have to put into the uh, accounting might not be taxable income. But in a first step, accounting, you have to do it. And uh, with those recordings, you fulfill this taxable income calculation where comes some differences. And for the students, it's good to remember now that we are talking about income taxation here and we have a separate session on value-added tax and how that works. Yes, and, and value-added taxation differs from this income taxation that value-added tax as well as salary taxes, they are going through the company. And so it means that, that they are not kind of uh, this company's income tax, but the real taxpayers are at the end in a different, uh, different places. So the company administers value-added tax and, and salary exactly. taxes, exactly. but it doesn't bear them, or at least to some extent, it doesn't bear them himself. Okay. So can you uh, once again explain, we, we are speaking about assets and expenses. So this is something which the company pays, but they are treated differently in accounting and also for tax purposes in a consequence. Uh, could you explain um, in a bit more detail what is the, the principal difference between assets um, of the company, which are to be recorded in the balance sheet, and expenses, which are to be recorded in the profit and loss statement? Yes. Uh, in the asset actually means that the company is expecting some future incomes of that. So it's not, or not yet used or not useful, unuseful, but you are expecting that it's somehow useful in the future. Either that you use it by yourself 
or it's possible to sell, or it earns separate income, like rental income or something like that. And then it means that the asset is kind of uh, uh, showing that we companies expecting some benefits out of that. It's not yet used. But this expense, it means that it in this year we lost this benefit or we lost this kind of money. We are not expecting any more that kind of thing, uh, that amount to come again into our, our kind of bank account, for example. Okay, so that means that if I buy a machine, for instance, which serves my company, uh, um, say I pay a million for this machine, uh, and it will serve my company longer, so I write it into the balance sheet, uh, and if I pay money to buy, or if I pay to my, if I pay my, my employee salary, then that's an expense. So the employee has done his or her job, and and that's it. So could that be a difference? Yes, as in this first uh, first point, that kind of a buying, for example, machine with which lasts, let's say, in average level of 10 years. And then you kind of deduct that purchase price, let's say 1 million, so that you put depreciations, so partly, for example, 10th part of that million for one every year, or in a separate kind of a a depreciation plan. How do you feel that that it, it, uh, it will flow into the expenses. And that's also that, that the, the company kind of uh, in a first hand makes, makes its own decision. But the accounting laws as well as taxation laws say some kind of a minimum and maximum levels. So you have to make your decision between those levels, but anyhow, it gives the company some possibilities to make their own choice. So the depreciation kind of reflects um, kind of the decrease in value of the asset for the company every year or based on a certain, a certain depreciation scheme. And there are separate rules in, in, the, in the tax code that say how such a depreciation has to look like. Um, for taxation purposes, it is. I assume it is for the for the entrepreneur. It would be, or for the company, it would be more attractive to have as much depreciation as early as possible. Is this the case? Yes, yes, and that's exactly kind of a, the let's lay, let's say a competition between the tax government and 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 the entrepreneur's view. And but but maybe one good example is that kind of. A, it's quite easy if you buy, for example, a machine. We can imagine that normally it lasts some years or so and so. But in this intellectual properties, it's very complicated. For example, you start a startup company. You, uh, you hire 10 workers who start to do this kind of research and development work. Nobody knows if there happens some, at the end, some useful, it might be just kind of a worth, of, uh, not worth of anything that work. But in this case, it's possible maybe to activate those wages out from the cost side up to assets, but only in very strict rules. So it's against the law if you activate, because it means that you show much better profit and too high assets. If you are not, doc- if you don't have a documentation that we really made something useful and we really uh, have a have a reasons to believe that these assets will be some bene- beneficial to us in the future. And if you don't have this documentation, you have a problem. Because you have showed your in your financial statements kind of a too bright future for the other stakeholders like investors or banks or or other other stakeholders. And that's against accounting law. 
So the depreciations, so the idea of depreciations is to reflect the value loss in the asset and the expense are just immediate expenses which you can immediately deduct from the taxable base. Wouldn't it be sensible to kind of as a, as an, as a company to kind of strive towards making as many depreciations as early as possible? Yes, exactly. From the... Uh lowering the taxable income point of view, exactly like that. And that's the reason why the tax laws says that what's the maximum depreciation in different type of assets. And, and, but we can also say that there's uh, not income taxation issues, but maybe in some cases, for example, in startup cases, if you are making losses a lot too much, you might lose your own capital, and there might become some other problems. And then it might be also kind of the aim that doing as, li as little depreciation as possible. But that's not taxable income issue, it's then kind of the company act issue. If I start a company and I do kind of research and development process, let's say I develop software, can I somehow activate this cost so that it's actually in my balance sheet and not direct cost when I pay the salaries, for example? It's a good question. And, and in first hand, all the salaries are yearly costs and expenses. But if you have some kind of a proof or documentation that you have uh, achieved something useful, for the future, some uh, incomes you, you expect, then you might have a possibility to activate so those wages up to the balance sheet assets. But then you must be kind of quite sure that some something useful has really happened. So it's possible, but you don't have to activate in, in your assets. So expenses can be deducted from the tax base immediately. What are expenses and what are not expenses? Uh, from the company income taxes and view, all the expenses which has been caused in the aim of achieving taxable income, they are deductible expenses. It can be in the short term or in the long term, the aim kind of approved. But in the other hand, all the private life, entrepreneurs' private costs are not deductible. They are not deductible even if they have been paid by a business card or from a bank, uh, company's bank account. That's not a proof of deductibility. And so uh, behind of those costs, you have to uh, show somehow the meaning of that cost. So that means that the costs that are associated with doing business are deductible and the costs that are associated with the entrepreneur's private life, they are not deductible from the tax base. Are there any special rules? Um, for instance, if I remember correctly, there's a rule um, on, on how much of restaurant expenses you can deduct. Are there some special rules or maybe some guidance where you can look up what kind of expenses are or what kind of private or semi-private expenses can be deducted? Yeah, there's some special rules in a tax law like like you can uh, um, some let's for example you can deduct 50 percent of the certain kind of uh, costs but and, and of course, there's a lot of guidance from the tax government, but at the end, it's question only that how you can prove it. Like typical expenses which are in between these lines are traveling costs, restaurant costs, and, and that kind of things which are in some parts mainly the private life costs, but they might be also kind of cost in, in, in the aim of achieving taxable income for the company. Okay, so let's go into more practical details. So when should you declare your taxes? And how is that done in, in practice? Yes, in, in practice, we, we follow 
every year rule. As a private person is taxed every year. And it means that every company, every company like Toiminimi or Osakeyhtiö must fulfill tax declaration every year. And in that tax declaration, you kind of make these your decisions, uh, which has been showed in your accounting. First, you made make every year accounting like financial statement, and with those figures, you fulfill your tax declaration where realize those differences between accounting decisions and taxable income calculation. But every year, and the, according to this tax laws, it's four months time when period has been ended. You must remember that the company might have different fiscal period than calendar year. For example, the uh, the financial period might end, let's say, at the last day of September. It means that you have, you have to fulfill your tax declaration at latest of, of uh, January, so four months after the end of your period. So also in practical level, do entrepreneurs do this taxation work themselves or do they use some kind of help, outsourced services? How does this happen? It's, uh, I would say that most of the companies, small companies, they use kind of accounting offices to help with them. It's possible to make it by yourself. You don't have to use anybody else. But nowadays, I, I would say that it's more and more complicated uh, kind of reporting, and there's all kind of all also other reporting responsibilities than only taxation, and they are changing a bit every year. I would say that in a small companies, it's totally kind of possible to make it by yourself. But for example, salary payments, dividend payments, any other kind of, a, kind of a, let's say, more detailed activities, then it's maybe better to use kind of a professionals for that case. Okay. So the entrepreneur and the limited liability company are separate from each other. So how can the entrepreneur receive money from the limited liability company? Yes, uh, as we discussed earlier, it's a separate decision. The company has to make a decision to pay for some reason money to the entrepreneur. So all the money uh, transfers into the private life has to be explained. And the possibilities are salary, which right away affects to those kind of a salary payment regulations and social security payments and so on. Maybe the dividend, which is kind of a decision and will be taxed according to the dividend taxation rules. It might be a loan and shareholder loan also has special taxation rules. It might be your interest, it might be a rent, anything, but it must have an explanation. And that explanation must be given yearly to the tax government according to your tax filings. And with that decision, there the tax law kind of realize how it will be taxed. So I guess a typical way um, could be that the entrepreneur is simply employed by the company and receives salary, which the company deducts um, from the tax base, and then the entrepreneur, him or herself, has to tax um, as personal income. Tax, uh, personal income. And then um, you spoke about dividends, so it is also possible to receive dividends out of the company. Um, how are they taxed, and is there any tax planning which can be done to optimize the overall tax burden. Mm. Yeah, that that there are different types of income from your company. It's just exactly the place for tax planning. For example, if you don't take anything, there's no taxes in your private life, but you don't get any money out of your company, which might be a problem for, for funding your private life. And if you take wages, it goes to the progressive income taxation, 
the more you take, the higher is the, the rate. And for example, dividends are taxed in between kind of a capital income level. And maybe if you take too much dividend, it goes also to this progressive tax rate. So it's kind of a tax planning of the wholeness, how and in which terms and how often, how much you take out of your company. You might also, it's important to remember that if there's, uh, you can't take dividends if the company is not making profits. So it's out of the question. Then you might have a right to take salary. But the dividend is possible only according to the company act that you have made profits. But it's absolutely kind of place of tax planning of the wholeness. I would say that also if you don't take any money, even if it's making profit, it means that the money stays in a company and you might sell the shares at the end with all the funds, not paid salaries, not paid dividends, and then you get all the funds kind of in an exit way and then it's kind of a capital income because you sold the shares. So in essence, the entrepreneur can harvest the value, so to speak, uh, that ha- has been built, either as getting salaries, dividends, this kind of cash flow from the company, or in a different way by selling the shares and then receiving the capital gain from somebody who wants to buy those shares. Yes, exactly. And, and then the taxation, even I would say that in, in, in a fundamental way, it's the same income. You earned something or something uh, you didn't earn. But in taxation, so formal, it's taxation is only based on what kind of income it was informally. Did you sell shares? Did you get salary? Did you get dividends? And then the taxation law kind of realize. But it's, it's true that you can make a huge tax planning. Normally, its problem is that how do you fund your private life? That's normally the practical issue in these cases, because during kind of a not no not um, taking money out in afraid of high taxation. But at the end, how do you fund your private life? It might lead to shareholders loan, which might might be also a big problem in the next year, for example. So it's important to plan this wholeness company taxation and your private life kind of the funding can't be separate if you don't kind of have a lot of money already in your private life. And this taxation system, we can also describe it like it's a delayed consumption. If you take money out of the company, the law kind of says that it goes out of the markets, out of the risk-based useful kind of a, a entrepreneur and it comes to your private consumption and then you lose all the benefits when uh, instead of that money stays in that markets and it is risk-based uh, activities. Um, so let us switch to the sole proprietorship. We have uh, said that kind of this is you from a tax base, so this is not a separate label. But it is still a business, and the business has to determine its profits too. How is the profit of a sole proprietorship or a partnership? I would, according to the same principles as in, in uh, limited liability companies. So it, what is the cost of the company? What's its cost of aiming this kind of uh, a profit for the company? But the main difference is that you don't have to do any separate transfers of funds to your private life because already all the profit is already your, your money and all the losses, losses are already from you. So you don't have to take kind of a salary or dividend or any kind of a loan because all the funds of the company already are your money in a good and in a bad way. And so it's much more easier. And normally we say that that in these cases, if you have a simple uh, 
activities and you anyhow need all the funds to your private consumption, then maybe you can't achieve with the limited live company any benefits because you anyhow have to take all the money right away to your private consumption. Then it's maybe this toiminim is easier and more practical form of business for you. So for freelancing, it often makes sense to be this toiminimi and not set up a different company for your kind of uh, billing or invoicing. Yes, exactly. Because then you avoid this kind of separate decisions that what kind of uh, income was it for me. And normally you don't achieve any kind of a tax benefits also for that because you can't delay your consumption. So are there any simplifications uh, of the kind of how to determine the profit for this freelancing kind of business? Yes, uh, also inside of accounting, there's some accounting laws which are lighter, easier, more simple, like cash-based accounting for small activities. And also in a limited liability, small activities, there's some kind of a, uh, lightened rules. And, and that's kind of a, maybe the one base why it might be a good reason with lower income levels, lower activity levels, to just to use this kind of a toiminimi instead of limited liability company. From from a tax perspective, you have the situation that um, then that you have the income made by the company is taxed first at the level of the company, 20%, and then once it is distributed to the owner, it is taxed again as a dividend. So you have two levels of taxation. Um, whilst in the case of a sole proprietorship or partnership, you have only this one level of taxation. Um, which is then, of course, progressively taxed, but um, the, the overall tax burden with these two levels of taxation can be, I assume, much higher, especially when the income is low, because with a low income, you have a rather low progression rate, meaning that this kind of problem um, of the progression really pushes through once you earn much more income. Yeah, yes, and that's that's true. And for example, if the company, if the limited liability company makes one euro profit, it will be taxed in 20%. And if it makes billion, it will be taxed in 20. But in this, uh, this uh, other type of companies, it's this progressive rate, it you can earn some amounts which when your progressive tax rate is still below of 20. And so it means that it doesn't make sense to kind of make profit in a limited liability company if your kind of a total profit income deducted with expenses and the profit stays in a lower level. Let's say like in nowadays it means about 20,000 euros per year in progressive tax rate is is below 20%. And also kind of a, kind of a private deductions in your private life is, is the kind of a detail after that. But anyhow, it's not so simple. It means that in lower income levels, maybe these other type of companies are just even lower taxed than in these limited liability companies cases. So what if I do business abroad or that I do business in several different countries? What are the tax implications? You know, many, many times it's a problem when, when you, are just, you have been in Finland for one year, two years. And then it's question that when those countries, that other country kind of let you go, or when Finland let you go, you move away from Finland, you have been living in other country one year, two years, three years. It's question that when Fini Finland kind of uh, let you go, and that's kind of a different kind of a type of uh, issues. Where's more detailed? Where's your home? Where you have your family? Where where's your company activities? Where where are your kind of uh, main? private life functions? Do you have a cottage in Finland or do you have kind of a, some other fixed properties in Finland and so on? It's kind of a 
different type of uh, question. Kind of uh, activities which happen in uh, two different countries. Uh, they have been, the decision is made according to the tax treaty between those countries. So it means that where do you have those main functions of the company, for example. For example, if the Finnish company has the main activities in other country, then the other country have a, a, a right to tax that income. And the terms in that tax treaty world, they are like permanent establishment. It means that what kind of functions you have kind of a, in a real life done. And according to this term, it might turn the taxation right to the other country. Also, in a private persons, when you move away from Finland, how long time Finland still tax you and when Finland let you go to be taxed in the other country. Also, one important term is that where's the situation of leadership? It's part of that permanent establishment term. So that means that if a Finnish company does business abroad, then it can be that it triggers a so-called permanent establishment in the other country, meaning that it has to file a tax return um, with respect to the income that is attributable to this permanent establishment in the other country. Yes, yes, ex that exactly. Normal just exploring, going and visiting is not kind of the, the trigger. But the trigger is that if you have a personal kind of a offices and factories and some functions in a permanent way in other country, that might be the uh, kind of a proof to be taxed also partly or wholly in that other country. Now, what are the key takeaways you want us to remember out of this discussion? Uh, I would say that it's uh, the main main question is that what plans you have. If your plans is just a simple kind of a selling your work part time or or kind of a, in a, some kind of a narrow atmosphere, maybe it's it's a better just to start the business with this kind of a sole uh, property. But if you have a idea to make kind of other partners or some funds and maybe kind of a longer term entrepreneurship, then for, for, for sure, then the limited liability company is better for you. Also that it's the higher risks you have in your business. It means that also it's not taxable income uh, question. Then the limited liability company again is for sure your choice. But maybe it's kind of a question that what kind of plans you have only selling your own work alone or making it somehow bigger or more complicated. That's the first question. Thank you very much for being our guest here. Thank you. It was my pleasure.